George Apostolakis, former NRC commissioner and now the head of the Nuclear Risk Research Center in Japan. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I'd love to get into your extensive career in risk management, both in the United States and internationally. But first, I'd like to hear a little bit about your life story. How did you uh, get into nuclear energy to begin with? Well, I was uh, born in Greece, raised in Athens, and finished the university there, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. And uh, in the last year, my professor of nuclear engineering said, you know, if anyone wants to go to America for graduate studies, contact me. Yeah. So I did. and. To make a long story short, I ended up at Caltech in Pasadena, California, where I got my master's and my PhD. Then I went down to UCLA, where an assistant associate, full professor mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the Department of uh, Mechanical, Aero, and Nuclear Engineering. And in 1995, I moved to MIT in the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering mm -hmm. until uh, 2010 when I was uh, nominated for the commission and I was confirmed by the Senate. So, so let's go back a little bit to your professor days because that's yeah. quite a lot of history to just jump right over. So you started at UCLA as an assistant professor, I assume, yes. in the mid-70s and... 74. 74, so that was before the NRC was established. I think it was established about right around, right around then? then, yeah. Right. Yeah. All right, so you were teaching courses in nuclear engineering, or or were you starting out in already in risk um, assessment? Oh, no, nuclear engineering and uh, in mechanical engineering, some mm -hmm. courses. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also started getting, getting into risk assessment and mm -hmm. management and that's where I made my career. Yeah, so you were really a, a pioneer of, of kind of risk well, assessment. And, this, and is, <laughs> this is a big word, okay? <laughs> One of the first people, yeah. to put it that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so did you kind of develop some of the curricula around risk yes, assessment with nuclear yes. and, and other large, complex technological yes. systems? There were courses on nuclear reactor safety, mm -hmm. which were focused on traditional safety analysis, thermohydraulics and all that. Mm -hmm. And then we had a, a course for senior undergraduates, first year graduate students on uh, probabilistic risk assessment. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit surprised because it was very popular among students who were not studying nuclear engineering. So what were they studying? Mathematics, other types uh, of engineering? Electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, Material science, you know, as, that's why I was surprised. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, the course is still being given at UCLA. What is it now? Forty years later. <laughs> By one of my former students, who's oh, wow. now a professor there. That must make you feel very proud. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and then we also had uh, for a while a graduate course. Mm -hmm where we got more. You see, the undergraduate, first year graduate course was focused on methods. One problem we had, I had, and everybody else has, is that by and large, students in their undergraduate days, except in electrical engineering, do not take any course on probability or statistics. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they do use some of it in laboratories, but not really a formal Not an course. applied version. So, I had to review probability and elementary statistics in the course. And that took up a long time. That's why we had the graduate course mm -hmm. that was really focused on nuclear reactors and so on. So that was the curriculum. Then when I moved to MIT, uh, they already had a course because Professor Asmussen was there, mm -hmm. had been there. And uh, I took over, plus another course that was for uh, a broader audience, 
more than a hundred students usually. And this was, uh, it had three components, uh, reliability, decision analysis, and I forget the third class, risk assessment, I guess. Yeah. So that was a very popular course. So, so yeah, so you've mentioned um, using methods of probability and probabilistic risk assessment. Yeah. So what are kind of the main core set of methodologies that are used to understand risk and safety in technological systems? Well, the basic rules of probability, uh, so elementary, like the probability of the union of events, of the intersection of events, but most importantly, well, and other stuff from there, elementary theory and statistics, uh, but the most important thing was to understand what probability meant. Mm -hmm. Because most people associate probability with relative frequencies. We toss a toy in a hundred times, 50 times it's heads, so the probability of heads is 0.5. Mm -hmm. When you deal with nuclear power reactors, you are dealing with very rare events not 0.5 or 0.1 or 0.01, you talk about 10 to the minus 4 and 5.00041 uh, and so on. Right. And it doesn't really make sense to interpret probability as a relative frequency. So what are you going to say? That uh, imagine that we have a million nuclear reactors right. and uh, it, it really creates conceptual problems. Fortunately, there was another theory of probability where the interpretation is very subjective. When I am about to do an experiment and flip a coin, and I say the probability of heads is 0.5, it's a statement of my belief in what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you say to scientists and engineers the probability is a measure of belief, they <laughs> you know, beliefs have no place in science. Right, right. But the truth of the matter is that it's a measure of confidence in your statement. And that has implications also on statistics. Uh, what is statistic? What is evidence? That's an interesting philosophical thing. Hmm. Again, in the relative frequency interpretation, evidence is the result of repeated trials. Right. For the subjectivistic interpretation, evidence is anything that gives you new information. And that information can come from statistics, the traditional statistics, but it can also come, say, for the judgment of an expert. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If uh, I meet an expert and he tells me, look, I've done all these experiments and I think this is going to happen, that's very useful information for me, which shapes my state of knowledge, mm -hmm. and therefore it's reflected on my probabilities. So, so probabilities, other statistics, and then also expert judgment, all of these elements... You put them together. Put them together and they form a, a risk assessment. And you they form your state of knowledge, as we say, mm. and probability is an expression of that state of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And these probabilities then are input into the probabilistic risk assessment, where you have pumps, valves, uh, natural phenomena, earthquakes, and so on, and each one has a probability. Usually it's it's not a single value of a probability, it's a distribution to express uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And you put everything together. Now, what is PRA? Maybe you need yes, to know. Yes, yes, let's, let's define that for our listeners. Okay, so that was the elementary stuff that you have to know in order to do it. Right. Now, since the earth, oh boy, we're going back. <laughs> since the earth was. Since the early days of. Uh, of the development of nuclear power. Mm -hmm. As you know, at the beginning it was for military purposes, but then the government decided that peaceful uses of uh, nuclear energy would be allowed, and President Eisenhower established the... Atoms for Peace. Atoms for mm -hmm. Peace, and so on. 
Now, the people who were in charge at that time were physicists. And not only physicists, but very brilliant people. And immediately they realized that uh, there was a possibility of accidents. Mm -hmm. So the objective was not to harm anybody, people, environment, and so on. Now, they didn't have the tools at the time, we're talking about the 50s and 60s now, the tools to quantify the probability of accidents. Mm -hmm. But there was a general belief that that probability was very low without being able to quantify it. Right. And uh, how do we make sure that that probability is low? So they came up with two very clever ideas. One was the so-called, and still is, defense in depth. Mm -hmm. Which means you will have multiple barriers that will prevent the release of radioactivity. Even if you think that you have done the best study in the world and this particular vessel will never fail, mm -hmm. the principle of defense in depth says you might be wrong. Right. So put extra protections like a big dome, you have seen the dome, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. emergency preparedness, all these are measures of defense. Fail safe there. systems. Mm -hmm. And the other principle was that of safety margins. If something fails at this temperature, make sure you never reach that temperature. There should be a margin between the operational temperature and the failure temperature. So the combination of defense in depth, the safety margins, was, it was believed that it would push the probabilities down, right. even though they could not quantify the probabilities. And the truth of the matter is that uh, these principles have worked very well. Mm -hmm. Now, in the, so the regulatory system was based on these two principles, and uh, it was, what we call a deterministic system. In other words, you design a pump, you do it this way. Right. Very prescriptive. And then they would postulate a set of around 15 design basis accidents. Mm -hmm. And the most severe one was the so-called large loss of coolant accident, where the largest pipe carrying cooling water is supposed to break in a guillotine matter, so you lose water from both sides. And you had to design the plant so that it would withstand such a severe accident. Uh -huh. And the thinking was that if you do that, if you design the plant that way, then anything else that happens will be covered by that envelope of very severe accidents. So you can call that a bottom-up approach. Right. In other words. Sounds very technical. Very technical, but also bottom-up. You have this piece of equipment, this is how you design, this is how you design, then this is the accident. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. PRA came about, well, there were some uh, indications early, but essentially the first study was published in draft form in 1974 by the Atomic Energy Commission at the time. This is the, the RSS, correct? The Reactor Safety mm -hmm. Study, yes. Or WASH 1400 or the Rasmussen Report and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took the opposite approach, top down. So you look at the whole plant and you ask yourself, what can go wrong? Mm. So you kind of brainstorm all the possibilities. Everything, including human operators. Mm. Yes, bringing in the, the human factors and kind of all of the other non-technical. Yeah, you know a lot, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you take my class. <laughs> I have not chemical engineering, a little different. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. In fact, the definition of risk assessment now is in terms of three questions, a so-called triplet. Mm. You look at the plant and you ask first, what can go wrong? then how likely is it? Mm -hmm. 
And third, what are the consequences? What can go wrong? That means develop accident sequences, not taking into account the regulations, but looking at the plant itself. What can go wrong? Mm -hmm. And with modern computers now, they develop millions of accident sequences. And this is all done today during the licensing phase of different reactor designs, or is this... Well, licensing, no. I'll come to that. Okay. <laughs> but uh, all the plants in the United States have a PRA. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you why in a moment. So we developed the accident sequences. But remember now, the ultimate goal is to manage risk. So developing, say, 800,000 sequences, it's useless. How are you gonna, what are you going to do with it? Mm-hmm. So the second question, how likely are they? Right, prioritization. Helps you to rank them. Mm-hmm. And the third, of course, is the consequences. And surprisingly enough, out of these hundreds of thousands of sequences, the dominant ones, the most likely ones, are between 15 and 20. Hmm. That really is a surprising result. Wow. I, I participated, I reviewed a PRA for the space shuttle many yeah. years ago. Yeah. They had many, 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 many more. Uh, more. And the reason is that nuclear plants are terrestrial systems. Hmm. And we can afford to apply defense in depth and multiplicity mm-hmm. and redundancy. They can't do that there because it can't fly right. if it's too heavy. Right. So single accident sequences that consist of a single failure do not exist for nuclear plants. Hmm. It's usually multiple, multiple failures. Failures. because of the defense in depth. Mm-hmm. Up there, they had more than a thousand single events. Right. Uh, accident sequences, you know, and the, the, that really shows you how heroic the astronauts oh, are. Oh, for sure. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> anyway, coming back to this, so we have the PRA, we have the dominant accident sequences, mm-hmm. and then the question is, what do you do with them? You get the probability, say, of uh, of core damage that is a certain number. Is that too high? Is it too low? What is it? So there, were, there was a lot of pressure on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by various groups in, in the late 70s. Mm-hmm. Who had just recently been formed at that, at that point, or yes. established, or it broken was, out, was, I guess. Right, uh, DOE was broken mm-hmm. out. And, uh, well, actually it's interesting, at the beginning, as I said earlier, uh, engineers really don't like probabilities, so or at least did not like at that time. So, and there was a lot of controversy. That uh, that was the time when the societal discussion of whether we want nuclear power or not was hmm. building up. Hmm. Jane Fonda and all, you know, the so movie, the, yeah. the movie, the China Syndrome. Mm-hmm. So. There was a lot of criticism directed at the reactor safety study that it underestimated the risks from nuclear power. Interesting. And the commission made a big mistake. Because of the controversy, they directed the staff do not use a study in regulatory matters. Hmm. 1975, 76. Then Three Mile Island happens in, in 1979. Yes. And somebody says, wait a minute now. What happened there is in this study, the sequence of events was a small or medium loca in the reactor safety study. So people went back, they opened and said, gee, you're right. Wow. What's going on here? Maybe there is something useful in here. Mm. So they changed the attitude towards the reactor safety study and uh, because there was really a lot of good information Mm -hmm. there and uh, then the pressure started building on the commission you have to tell us what numbers are acceptable so there was a long period of public deliberations 
and they, uh, I think in 1986, they issued uh, the so-called quantitative health objectives mm -hmm. or safety goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically they said the risk from nuclear power should be less than one tenth of one percent of all other risks. For example. And how did they come to that? It's a policy issue. Okay. There was a debate and, you know, it could have been a different form, but that's what they mm -hmm. selected. Uh, okay, so if the risk of dying from accidents of a resident of the United States is about 10 to the minus once every 10,000 years or so, you divide that by a thousand, mm. and that's the goal for nuclear power. Interesting. Very low number. And uh, now with the goals and their variations, people knew what to do with the numbers from the PRAs. Mm -hmm. And of course the industry, I was working for the industry at the, as a consultant at mm. the time, and I saw it from the inside that if the number was close to the goal, phew, they would do something to bring it down. Mm -hmm. Actually modifying the plant, Physically. spending money mm -hmm. in other words. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes it was an analytical thing because of the many conservatisms. Anyway, so the other interesting thing is that in the first uh, 20 years after the reactor safety study and the industry started doing PRAs, improving on the methodology and so on, there was a lot of activity. And I was very fortunate to be part of it. Yes. But for the first 20 years or so, the NRC staff was very happy to take vulnerabilities that the PRAs had identified and issue new regulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you do that, you alienate the industry. Interesting. Because the industry's attitude was, or perception, gee, this new PRA thing, all it does is creates new regulations. Right. So there was a certain cool attitude and uh, in the 90s, especially after Chairman Jackson took over, there was a lot of pressure from the industry also on the Commission because they were finding that a lot of the existing regulatory requirements did not contribute to safety hmm. in a significant way. Mm -hmm. And this is not surprising because these regulatory requirements were developed in the 60s, as I said earlier, and it was really the judgment of people that would gather a bunch of guys in a room. What do you think? What do you think? Well, yeah, do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it turned out a lot of these requirements really were not significant. So there was pressure on the Commission, and uh, in 1997, under a lot of pressure from the Commission, Chairman Jackson, the staff issued a regulatory guide, which is really a landmark regulatory guide known as 1.174, which told the world how risk information can be used in regulatory affairs. So at this point, you're already at the NRC, I was a member of the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards. I was not a commissioner. Right, right, but you're, 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 yes. did you have a role in that? Um... A big role. Yeah, talk to me about that. <laughs> because I was, I don't know if you know what the ACRS is, it's a statutory committee mm -hmm. of about 15 nominally outside experts, part-timers mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. come and advise the commission. But it's established by law. I think it's one you. It's one of the two statutory advisory committees in Washington. Hmm. Oh, what's the other? Do you the know? others are not statutory. Yeah. So I, I was appointed to the commission uh, to the committee in 1995, and as I said, in 1996, 97, the staff had to produce this. We had a lot of subcommittee meetings. 
Of course, the staff did the work. I was just listening and commenting along with my colleagues, mm -hmm. and sometimes offering some advice. But those were, I would say, really heroic days. I mean, creating something out of nothing. How to use the tra traditional system, defense in depth, safety mm -hmm. markets, with a new kid, PRA, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we came up with this risk-informed approach. So that was, in my view, one of the major achievements of the NRC staff. I was on the ACRS for 15 years, from 95 to 2010. Mm -hmm. And at what time did you think, maybe I want to join this organization, or, or how, how, how did no, you transition? No, that's not how it works. Right, you, you're appointed. You're appointed. Uh, the way it works is the White House leaks a name mm. to see the reaction. So. Well, first of all, somebody called me and asked me. <laughs> Get a little warning. So they leaked the name. Nobody objected. So then there is a formal nomination that's sent to the Senate. There was a hearing of the Energy and something committee mm -hmm. with two other candidates. And then the whole Senate votes. Mm -hmm. and you become a commissioner. So I took the oath of office in April of 2010. So you, you don't campaign for a job like that. Right. You know, you and what was that transition like coming from such a, a long career in academia, consulting in industry, and then advising the NRC, and then being in a position yeah. to really make decisions? Right, the, the right. Uh, it was interesting. I was very familiar with the NRC because of my tenure on the ACRS. So I knew people, I knew everybody. The interesting thing is that after it was announced that I would be a commissioner, NRC staffers who were supposed to interact with me mm -hmm. started practicing pronouncing my name. <laughs> <laughs> Up until that time, they didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that's a side note. <laughs> no, I get that, <laughs> for but, sure. <laughs> but uh, being a commissioner was really very interesting and uh, very different from being on the ACRS. Yeah, what was kind of the, the yeah. day in the life? What yeah, was well, the yeah, full time there. I mm -hmm. moved to Washington with my family. Mm -hmm. And... Um, each commissioner has a staff of six, one technical advisor on nuclear materials, one on nuclear reactors, a chief of staff, and a secretary, and an administrative assistant, and a legal advisor. Yes, that's some sort yeah. of counsel. Mm -hmm. So that's six. So. You know, it, it's a very interesting job. Everybody respects you because of the position. Uh, they're really concerned. Some people are concerned what you're thinking about a particular issue. There were visits by the industry, industry representatives complaining about something or, you know, advocating something uh, and that was done always the meeting was between them me and the federal employee mm -hmm. it was never in private and uh, actually you know there were a lot of intervenor groups they never showed up hmm. and one time i remember there was a meeting in washington with intervenors and they complained, of course, like everybody else does. But at the end, I admonished them. I said, look, guys, you never come. You complain that the industry comes and sees me and the other commissioners, but you never request any time. So two or three of them eventually did. They came once, but that was not their cup of tea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Lots of different stakeholders you have to deal with. Very different, deal with. yeah, and uh, you know, there are public meetings, as you know, mm -hmm. people, very formal meetings. People present their views when they're asked. And uh, I, I thought it was a great process. Uh, there are five commissioners, as you probably know. Mm -hmm. No more than three can be in the same room. I've heard this. Yeah. Yes, yes, very if three of them funny. meet, it has to be a public meeting. Hmm. So you can't become best friends. <laughs> no. No. Well, what happens is you meet with them individually. Right. Periodically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, not three. <laughs> right. So now you joined the commission officially in 2010. Yeah. And then a year later... Fukushima. Yeah. So what was that experience Those like? Those were the days. <laughs> well, you know, people get scared, especially on the West Coast, that radioactive clouds will come or the sea or the ocean will be contaminated. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knew in the first, in the early days what was going on. I mean, there was an explosion, of course. But, and in the beginning, of course, naturally, the Japanese were reluctant to uh, accept foreign aid. Mm -hmm. and they changed their attitude when they realized the magnitude of the accident. So we, uh, in Washington, I mean, the White House was asking questions. People were asking questions. Mm -hmm. And the chairman had to deal, Chairman Yatsko had to deal with all this. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know. We didn't know. And he was asked to go to the White House, where there was a press conference. You know, it's very difficult to do these things. People, when people are really worried, and you don't know enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, slowly the picture started taking shape. And we also sent uh, at least one senior a member of the NRC staff, and he spent some time there. To advise or, or to learn? Advise, mm -hmm. to advise, very experienced person. He even advised the office of the prime minister, I mm -hmm. heard. And, uh, and then also the question was, what should we do in this country? Now, right. there is a problem there because the accident happened in another country. Mm -hmm. And the regulatory system there is not the same as ours. Mm -hmm. And anything you do here costs the industry a lot of money. I mean, it never costs a hundred dollars. Right, say. right. So it was a difficult situation and we formed what was called the near term task force. And uh, they were supposed to look at Fukushima, and within a few months, they were supposed to come back and make recommendations to the Commission. Mm -hmm. For the United States fleet. For the United States fleet. And boy, did they go do a good job. They hmm. really did a great job. I think they overdid it with the recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> but they were really very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. And as I say, it was really a very short period of time when our knowledge of the accident was still evolving. So the commission took immediate action on two or three recommendations, mm -hmm. and the others were postponed and needed more research and more investigation. Yeah, so does the NRC kind of look into maybe the cost implications or the technical no, no, implications? No, 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 the NRC never looks at cost. Right, it's, right. It's, actually, that's another thing. <laughs> it's not never. They're looking mostly we just have, at safety. We have, we have this uh, concept of uh, adequate protection. Right. The law, the At Atomic Energy Act, talks about the Atomic Energy Commission and then the NRC making sure that there is adequate protection of public health and safety and the common defense and security. Now, what is adequate protection? Yeah, yeah I was going to ask you. <laughs> there is no definition. Mm -hmm. Adequate protection is what the Commission says it is, mm -hmm. which sounds arrogant, 
but really it isn't. It's very hard, almost impossible to define what adequate protection is. But the Commission is very cautious. They don't issue new regulations in the name of adequate protection unless it's absolutely necessary, and they do that very, very infrequently. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain respect of the concept. But there was a court case here in Washington years ago where the court said, the Court of Appeals, that uh, the Commission can consider safety measures that go beyond adequate protection, but for those, the Commission can actually use cost-benefit analysis. Interesting. Okay. So for adequate protection, cost doesn't come in. Of course, and that, that makes You do it. Sense. You have mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. Beyond adequate protection, you can apply cost-benefit. So the Fukushima recommendations, which camp did those follow? The first two or three that we, were in the name of adequate protection, mm -hmm. so there was no discussion. Exactly. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the others were varying degrees of cost benefit, but took a long time. I mean, they're still working on some. Considering some yeah. of this. wow. Because nothing happens in a month. Mm -hmm. You know, these are big changes. So. And also, like you said, the, the regulatory systems and the fleets themselves are all very different. So That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. It turned out that the regulatory system in Japan was really not... Uh, I have to find the right word. <laughs> uh, it was not independent of the industry. It was, mm. The agency was very weak. Mm. So that's not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. But another point that's interesting, this cost-benefit analysis for proposals that go beyond adequate protection, it's implemented only in America. We are the only ones who have that. Interesting. Now, maybe other nations do it informally, I don't mm -hmm. know. Or through non-regulatory bodies or Yeah, something. I don't know how they if they do it. Mm -hmm. But we have formal rules how to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In general, the, the regulatory system is different from other countries by its formality and lawyer intervention. And right. Stuff, <laughs> like everything else. Right, right. So, yeah, so that was it. Yeah, so looking back at, uh, so, so I guess you're, you worked pretty closely on implementing the Fukushima recommendations, did that work kind of lead to your relationships that eventually led you to working with the this new research center in Japan? Oh, my tenure on the commission ended June 30th, 2014. Mm -hmm. That was three years after Fukushima, right? Mm -hmm. 2011. Mm -hmm. Of course, after Fukushima, there was a huge turmoil in Japan. People became very negative towards nuclear right. power, and you can't blame them for that. They realized that uh, a lot of the things they were doing, the regulatory system and the companies, needed uh, serious revisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the plants were shut down. Right, immediately. Mm -hmm. I wow. heard that the cost of about $25 billion per year for, to the country for replacement energy. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if it's correct number, that's what I heard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so the industry then wanted to come back. I mean, there's tremendous investment in nuclear power. Right. And they could not, the country could not keep importing fuel, mm -hmm. coal or gas and so on. So, the first thing was that the, the country, I mean, the government, created this new regulatory authority, NRA, Nuclear Regulation Authority, mm -hmm. or Agency Authority, which, because numerous studies had shown that the previous regulator was very weak and uh, not independent, mm -hmm. they went the other way. They kind of adopted the Extremely, United States model? Extremely, no, worse than that. Oh. 
independent became also almost synonymous with isolation. Interesting. You see, the commission here is independent, but we always talk to the industry. Right. The industry There's talks formal about, mechanisms for, for yeah, all of that. Mm -hmm. They isolated themselves because of the political pressure. Interesting. And they started issuing regulations, very stringent regulations. And the industry, of course, was beaten down and they would never object to anything. Uh -huh. And it started costing hundreds of millions of dollars for the power plants to get uh, restarted, right. to get licensed. Mm -hmm. They had new, new re-licensing and go through all of these yeah, new regulations. After the accident. Mm -hmm. And uh, another interesting difference between Japan in uh, the United States is that even though the regulator may say this plant is safe, it can start, the local government has to agree. Ah, okay. If the local mayor or governor says no, it doesn't start. So they have a, a say in whether or not the plant is operational, not yes. just, wow. Even though the regulator says it's safe and it has happened. They, they've gone against they the regulator. No. They said no. Uh, now. So it just, it's, it's becoming a political issue. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yes. It is. After such an accident. Mm -hmm. Now, I said this is different. Yes, it is different between Japan and the U.S. Here, it's the NRC that issues the license and the mm -hmm. plant stuff. But at some level, local government here also can influence mm -hmm. what happens. And that's Yucca Mountain. Nevada is against it. It's not starting, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's very different. Over yes. there, it's more common that the local judge, or if they take you to court, judge has to agree. And in my mind, that creates problems because I don't know on what basis a judge can say that the plant is not safe. Uh, anyway, that's the yeah. system in Japan. We have to respect it. And the industry now, during that period after 2011, uh, realized that they had to change the way they do business. And they were they admitted more or less, that they never really took PRA seriously. Interesting. Because some criticism of uh, Fukushima was that if they had done a PRA for the plant, they would never have placed the fuel for the diesels in the so low, uh -huh. so it was vulnerable to the to tsunami. The tsunami. Uh -huh. And they never really looked at the issue of a station blackout where you don't have electric power, AC power mm -hmm. at all. So there was this criticism too. Mm -hmm. but they had done some PRAs that came out with incredibly low numbers, like one in a million, one in 10 million, and nobody really paid attention to that. So the senior management of the industry realized that they had to do something and take PRAs more seriously. Right. And uh, PRAs, by their very nature, look at so-called severe accidents, accidents that go beyond the design basis. Mm -hmm. And they never really had paid much attention to those. So how to do it, how to do it? Well, let's create a research institute mm -hmm. center, center. Because the, the institute, CREEPI, Central Research Institute for the Electric Power industry, uh -huh. Epi, <laughs> was uh, established in the early 50s. So it's been there for a long time. And I imagine they kind of focused on the whatever Japan's traditional approach to reactor safety was. Not only reactor, electric power. Electric power. Mm -hmm. Transmission and so on. Very technical, very technical people. But now they decided in 2014, 13, 14, to establish this Nuclear Risk Research Center to focus on risk, PRA, risk management, and so on. Mm -hmm. And who better to head it then? <laughs> <laughs> You're challenging my <laughs> modesty. Uh, 
uh, so that it it happened that as I said June 30th of 2014 mm -hmm. uh, I left the commission and uh, then I was asked to meet with some Japanese managers maybe in September or late August so they came to Washington mm -hmm. we met in a hotel and they made this proposal and they already knew that I and others, I guess I, they talked to other people too, would not be willing to move to Japan. Mm -hmm. So the deal was to, for me to go there every three months and stay for two weeks. And there would be a Japanese senior manager running the center day to day. And we, we have, you know, email, video conferences and so on when I'm mm -hmm. in the States. So I started October 1st, 2014. So it's been now almost five years. Yeah. Right? And so what is kind of your role? Are you setting the research agenda, approving the research agendas? Kind of... Meeting? Yeah, it's, it's actually a very nice role <laughs> because I don't have administrative duties. Right. <laughs> if there is something big, they consult with me, but no. Um, Every time I go, we have research projects, especially in Japan, as you know, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, I mean, mm -hmm. that's the major threat. Mm -hmm. So we are developing very sophisticated models for tsunamis, earthquakes. Actually, when it comes to, earth, to seismic risk, I think the Japanese are ahead of everybody else the traditional engineering, mm -hmm. the seismic damage of Fukushima mm -hmm. was next to nothing. Wow. How far away was it? From? I guess it was, it was pretty far because the, the earthquake was under... The earthquake was, was far away. Far away. But, but the tsunami killed everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But really, the seismic <laughs> damage was nothing. Wow. It was the water that created the accident. Mm -hmm. So that shows you how good they are when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're developing models, probabilistic models for earthquakes, tsunamis, and so on. And uh, I review what they're doing, approve, disapprove, give advice. Mm -hmm. So then we are, we really want to push risk management, the concept of risk management, uh, because they're still in the traditional deterministic system that mm. I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything is you do this, you do that. That's going to be an uphill battle, but uh, we're laying the foundations. Mm -hmm. And we developed with the, what well, we developed, but the utilities agreed, uh, and a strategic plan and an action plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, strategic plan is, you know, to actually use risk information in decision making. An action plan is this is what How we're gonna do should it. do. It. Yeah. Steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know the. So I'm I'm involved in that a lot, and then every now and then I write articles for newspapers or uh -huh. whatever. Uh huh. Uh huh. Meet with. Uh, very senior people, chief executive officers, and so on, CNO, chief nuclear officers, and uh, yeah. So you're so you're through those meetings and and the articles you're writing. You're really communicating the 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 I guess the the new culture that you're trying to establish. Yes, that's right. right. How, what's the most challenging part of of those meetings and really trying to push forward the this new way of approaching What safety. it comes down to, which is the most difficult part, two things. Changing the culture of the engineers and scientists. The whole nuclear establishment in Japan has been educated and operated in a traditional engineering 
environment. Mm -hmm. Changing, switching over to probabilities mm. is very difficult. People can say, yeah, sure, of course, PRA is great. But when it comes to doing something, they revert to what right. they know already. Right. And that's a cultural issue that and, we're trying very hard to change. And kind of looking beyond Japan and the U.S., how, what is the international status of using oh, PRAs no. um, in risk assessment? Is this something that most, of, most other nations have already adopted? Yes. Or? Okay, yes. so Japan is kind of catching up then? Japan is catching up. Uh, the, the French, the Swedes, the, the Germans are going to shut down, but mm. the English, yes, they are using PRA. Again, it comes back to what I said earlier, we tend to be much more formal here. Mm -hmm. Over there, they have explained to me, look, we don't have to be like you. We get in a room and we talk about it and we do whatever we need to do. So the actual implementation may be different but they certainly do it. Mm -hmm. So Japan, for some reason, was behind anyway. Anyway, so that's part of it, the change in the culture. And then the other part is communicating with the public. Mm -hmm. That's an almost impossible task after such a... And why is it impossible? Yeah. Because before the accident, the industry was assuring the public that the plants are safe, period, safe. Mm -hmm. And then you have this big disaster. And of course, the public says, well, you lied to me or whatever. Right. right. So there's a very negative attitude. And so how do you navigate that? Well, you can't. If you know a good way, I'll be happy to <laughs> listen to you. Risk communication has been a subject of study for the last 30, 40 mm -hmm. years, even in this country, actually mm -hmm. in this country. There is a journal, Risk Analysis, a lot of papers on risk. Uh, I don't think there is any magic way of communicating mm -hmm. effectively. Uh, there, there is advice, like I remember some time ago, NASA was going to launch a rocket that had plutonium in it. And of course, as usual, people... Got scared. And one ad piece of advice that I thought was very interesting, that the organization, not just NASA, should use a woman who is who's a mother of young children <laughs> because she's much more believable. Much more trustworthy. Yeah. Interesting, interesting <laughs> technique. Now in Japan, you have a meeting in the room. There are no women, so I said that was. I said, <laughs> where can we find? Them? <laughs> because in engineering, you know, mostly, mostly overwhelmingly men. Anyway, that I don't think that's a rigid rule that unless you have a woman. Right. <laughs> But it helps, mm -hmm. and it also shows you that we really don't know how to effectively communicate. Or maybe the problem is way too difficult. I mean, the guy has seen this tremendous accident. People have left their, family, their uh, houses, mm -hmm. and they are told that for decades there will have to be a way. I mean, I would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I would be very upset and say, these guys don't know what they're doing. So it's very difficult. Now, as I said, the public attitudes are slowly changing. Depends very much on the local people in some local communities. Restarting the plant mm -hmm. is not such a big deal. People tend to believe the NRA, the regulator. In other places, they are very, very skeptical. Mm -hmm. And of course, let's not forget, having a nuclear plant at a particular location brings a lot of money mm -hmm. to the community. I mean, serious income from taxes mm -hmm. and so on, roads, schools. So people may not be willing to say that in the open, but I'm sure it's part of their decision making. Right, right. Um, so that's a, a really a big problem communicating with the public and uh, I, I yeah. don't know. 
But look, it was a similar situation, although not the same in the States, when Three Mile Island happened. It was not the same disaster as Fukushima, because the containment worked. Right. But still, it shook up people. And then you had Chernobyl mm -hmm. a few years later. Mm -hmm. Again, the same argument. It was the Soviet Union, very different rules, and so on. Although you couldn't say that for Three Mile Island. But uh, the, the public confidence was shaken also in this country. And I, I think what matters is after an accident for many years, nothing happens and people tend to forget and accept the fact that accidents happen and so mm -hmm. on. So in Japan, it's still too soon. Yeah. Well, so as we wrap up, uh, could you kind of paint a picture for me of where you see kind of the industry going? What are some of the, the things that we need to be thinking about um, in the future? In the United States. Sure, yes. The state of the nuclear power industry in the United States is not good. The reason is that, primarily, the reason is economic. Those plants, because of defense in depth and all these things, are very expensive, mm -hmm. very expensive. It's what, and what is worse is that you have a certain budget and then when you are actually building it, the budget doubles and triples. We're talking about billions of dollars. So a utility has to think twice or thrice before they launch right. such a project. And then, natural gas became very inexpensive because mm -hmm. of fracking. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a utility executive, what are you going to do? Invest seven, eight, ten billion dollars to build one nuclear unit, or maybe a few million to have a natural gas? The choice is obvious. And so, so why do you find nuclear energy kind of personally important? Well, the benefit, the great benefit is it, it does not pollute. Right. So this climate change, which this summer really was terrible. <laughs> I mean, I Quite was, a hot one. <laughs> not only here, but in Europe, it was, it was awful. Yeah. And in Siberia, they, they saw 20 degrees Celsius. In Siberia, for heaven's sakes. So I think that's a major advantage and there are also political advantages in other words if we start abandoning nuclear power nobody will pay attention to us internationally mm -hmm. okay so there is also a matter of pride and influence and so on so the to counter the economic problem we have now small modular reactors that are being built no, not built yet, er, designed. Mm -hmm, and licensed. Mm -hmm. And one from uh, New Scale Power is undergoing review at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I'm on the technical advisory board of New Scale. Great. So I may be a little biased, but I don't <laughs> think I am. I think it's a very good design. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going very well. The review process is going very well. And of course, because it's modular, you have small modules and you can put up to 12 of them together. And so many new applications. Mm -hmm. It's much cheaper. Mm -hmm. For example, if you can build the first module, say, for three billion or two billion dollars, before you build the other ones, this one can start producing power. So mm -hmm. it relieves the burden. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the big uh, reactors, 1400 megawatts or whatever, I heard the latest estimate was $20 billion. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. You invest $20 billion before you see a single megawatt? Right, right. See, that's a big difference mm -hmm. with small modular, that you can do it in phases. Mm -hmm. And also the risks are much, much lower because the inventory of radioactive materials is much, less. much less. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, people have learned from experience. So I think 
it's safe to say that these SMRs are safer. Uh -huh. And uh, I think that's the main hope of the industry right now. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Commissioner George Ap Apostolakis. There you are. <laughs> Thanks so much for speaking with me today. All thank right. you for having me here. Yes. Okay.